welcome, welcome to Health Issues. I'm your host, Chris Sylvain, and we're so thoroughly excited about today and a subject that it's been, uh, been so interested in is history. And uh, we actually have a very unique but an awesome uh, professor. We have assistant professor of history at Tulane University, uh, Dr. Robert Gilpin. Thanks. Pronounce it right? Yeah, you got it right. That's right. I try and nail it every once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> History. Let's uh, uh, history now. I'll let you describe your area of interest, your research interest in history. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I started out sort of, you know, just being interested in anything to do with American history. I was studying history all over the world, right. um, but when I started doing my PhD, I really got focused on the history of slavery um, and the angle I sort of took. You know, there's hundreds of historians working and thousands that have worked on the history of slavery. Okay. Um, but particularly what interested me was what happened to slavery or our understanding of slavery after slavery ended. So what did people, what were people saying about it? What were people thinking about it? How did it sort of get into our DNA? And that's both black and white people. Right, right. After 1865. Um, that's really sort of the project that I'm most interested in getting to the bottom of. Okay, well, bring us a little deeper into it because it's not necessarily looking at Jim Crow per se of Reconstruction per se. You're looking, uh, tell us about this approach. Yeah, so, I mean, I was telling you a minute ago that I really had ambitions to be a writer. So okay. when, you, when you realize that maybe you can't do that, <laughs> you say, well, maybe it'd be fun to look at writers. Okay. Um, so I started looking particularly at Southern novelists. Okay. Um, and most of these guys are white. Okay. Um, and a lot of them actually started writing either sort of concurrently with the Civil War or immediately after. And their writing is really overtly political in that it's trying to prove black inferiority, white superiority. Um, it's trying to sort of say, like, look at this world that we lost because these damn Yankees came down here, okay. um, and how can we get it back? Really? Um, and some of them are not doing that so explicitly. That becomes less the case sort of after 1900. but. I really was interested in the ways that Southern writers were processing, you know, either the world that they had heard about at their grandparents' knees or, you know, that they were growing up all around. How did that history sort of get passed down to them either explicitly or sort of subconsciously? That is so major, in other words, that, um, because it's almost like a big black hole, you know what I mean? Like after the Civil War, I mean, okay, what happened? I mean, we know Reconstruction happened, but to, 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 as if, okay, the South lost the war, but how did they feel? Well, so, I mean, a lot of this is my, my advisor in graduate school, his sort of big contribution to scholarship, and he's one of the sort of big guys in the history of the Civil War, uh, a guy named David Blight. Um, he really, uh, wrote this very important book called Race and Reunion, which was saying that essentially white people got together after the war, white people in the North and the South, and said, you know what, let's just put this behind us, and who's the victim in that process? African Americans. Oh. And so basically, you know, his, his point somewhat is that white Southerners won the peace. They might have lost the war, wow. <laughs> but what they won was the aftermath. And I mean, I, I was just teaching my students this week, you know, in 1866, these books start coming out written by white Southerners saying, okay. we have to take control of, our, of the history books because that's the way we're gonna actually win. You know, if we let Yankees tell the story of the right. war, right. they're gonna tell the story that they were the good guys and we were the bad guys right. and that slavery was wrong. Okay. But if we take over, we might be able to change that script. And they focused on this, I mean, so intensely. So, you know, the reason why if you go to any town in the South right. and you see the, statue of the Confederate soldier right. is because they won the peace. You're right. <laughs> you don't have to look you very far. I mean, really. I mean, you know, Robert E. We drive down yeah, Robert least, E. Lee. Yeah, and yeah, exactly. Exactly. Jefferson. I was just on Jefferson Davis right now. This, this, is, is, yeah, this is it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you know, the South is much more concrete. This is not to say that these same, some of these same things aren't going on north of the Mason-Dixon line or west of the South. Right. But in the South, it's just so explicit. The celebration, the heroism, the mythology of Confederate soldiers, right. and most of the time, what they fought for. Right. So if you go to any of these monuments, I, I actually haven't been up on Lee Circle because I, it, you know, it kind of makes me cringe. Right. <laughs> but if you were to stop and go up and look at those monuments, what you're gonna find is an inscription that says, our brave soldiers who fought for a righteous cause and if you stop and think for a second, if you're not on that side, you think, well, the righteous cause they were fighting for was to keep 
slavery, <laughs> to enslave other human beings. So, and those monuments are in every southern town. They won. They won. They won. We think they lost. <laughs> The culture, the flag, yeah. the the embracing of the antebellum South, yeah. and the 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 food, the the right. the whole plantation mentality. Yep, Mardi Gras, everything. Just. Oh man, Mardi Gras. I mean, so I've only I've only lived in New Orleans for a couple of years. My son's okay. obsessed with Mardi Gras. He's three years old. He had okay. five parades on his birthday this year. I mean, it was like. <laughs> But when you go to Mardi Gras and you're and you're looking at these guys, I mean, they look they're like clan. It's like the clan. Yes. And you're thinking to yourself, I mean, they clear they're not got, All right, we no, hope. Go ahead. You're we good, hope that they're not clan members now. <laughs> but we're watching them and they're in, you know, they're in the hoods and they're on the horses and you're thinking like this is just too close for comfort, right? It's all around us. Yes. Good lord. We can end the show now. <laughs> <laughs> the end. <laughs> the end. All right, now, so carry us through your research, these writers, these individuals. Uh, that, how, how did they uh, win so easily? Because it's almost as if nobody's fighting. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a roller coaster ride. I mean, there's there's ups and downs, and there are periods where I mean, the South is being treated, and I mainly mean the white South when I'm saying that, right. by the rest of the nation as the sort of backwards, yeah. especially yeah. sort of a you know morally backwards place. Okay. okay. Um, but in terms of the uh, the sort of on the ground reality, you know, not that much changes between uh, you know April of 1860 and April of 1866. I mean, what is what changes for you know black people on the ground in Mississippi or Alabama or Georgia? The material reality of their lives remains, you know, frighteningly similar. And so, I mean, and that's something that needs to be maintained. And so, I, you know, I was actually showing my students this uh, Oklahoma uh, SAE video this week. And just asking them, you know, what's going on in this video? Is this white supremacy or is this racism? And you know, that maybe there's no distinction there, but one of the things I'm trying to get my students to think about is, wh is whether there's a line there, whether if white people are getting together and saying, we're better than everybody else, okay. there's racism implicit in that, okay. but there also may be, it may be sort of less overtly racist and therefore more palatable to your, your average white American than okay. you know, black people are terrible, right. ignorant, stupid. Right. Right, and so forth, right, whereas right. white supremacy might be more comfortable even if they're not gonna call it white supremacy. Uh, you, you, you're blowing my mind because see, you, you're right that, that white supremacy and racism, uh, we're just talking to uh, actually another professor from Tulane earlier this morning, and the, the goal is the hearts and minds of the people. Yeah. Yeah, it's like what do you call reality is what counts. Yeah, so it might be. I mean, in, in that sense, I think the appeal, you know, when we I, my students were having a very hard time getting over this hump with white supremacy because when we think of white supremacy, we think of hoods, right. or we think of swastikas. Right. I mean, we think of terrible things. Okay. Okay. And when we think of racism, we think of terrible things too. But white supremacy might have sort of a more appealing. It might be an easier way to appeal to people to right. say, well, like. White people, we want to live together. We want to have access to economic power and better schools and all these things. And so people aren't thinking of it in racist terms, but it's actually like it, it much more profoundly, you know, suppressive, as in keeping another population down, which is obviously something that white Southerners are particularly interested in once slavery is gone. Like, how do we keep this population, which we've had complete control of for centuries, how do we continue to do that? And tell me if I'm wrong. If the focus is on racism, there's no way to win because you can't eliminate people's deep beliefs and heart. But if we focus on white supremacy, then that becomes legal, regulatory, structural, education. Yeah, I mean, it reminds me, <laughs> this is just occurring to me now, that there was this rhetoric around the uh, last midterm elections where the uh, Republicans were saying, well, we have to have something positive. We can't just have a negative ideology, like we hate this guy, okay. or we hate, this, we hate the okay. Democrats. We have to have something to put forward. Right. White supremacy is actually putting something forward, <laughs> whereas racism is just saying, we hate these people. Right. But white supremacy is saying, white people are the, are the you know, teachers and guiders of civilization. European. 
Yeah, so if so, we need to positively do this to help everybody else. Oh, come on! So it's just—I mean, it's this—it's still at base pretty much the same ideology, but it's it's advocating for something positive rather than something negative. American exceptionalism. Yeah, I mean, and I mean, these guys writing in in the immediate post-war and during Reconstruction are talking about white civilization. They talk about the Aryan civilization stretching back thousands of years to the Greeks and the Romans. And I mean, it, uh. It, Slave owners did this too, as a way to justify their institution. But that thread becomes really strong. I mean, it, particularly in Louisiana. I mean, these guys are just like out of control in terms of you know putting forward this thing that we have to protect white people from the threat of black freedom. And so that's something they're really like they're chasing that. I mean, I sent my students this uh, campaign poster. I, I think it's from the. Uh, 18, it's, I think it's from the 1876 election, but it may be 1872, which is, you know, it says Democratic Party for the white race, and then it's got this horrible sort of uh, racist character of an uh, African American, and then it says Republican Party. It just says Republican Party to that. So, like, the idea that the Democratic Party was to save the white race, I mean, that's white supremacy. Good. Good. You know, it's underpinned by all this racist ideology, yeah. but. It's to fight for white supremacy. The, 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 the whole foundational philosophical driver. Yeah, oh yeah. And I think the thing that makes, it, it makes this conversation so difficult, my class started, I mean, you know, everyone's a little bit nervous that first day. What do you talk about? So I always start by saying, you know, what do you guys think of the Confederate flag? You know, it's an easy way just to get people sort of engaged in okay, this topic. Okay. But the thing is, ultimately things like that are kind of a red herring because they, they distract us from some of the more fundamental, because you know, if you go to most parts of this country, no one cares about the Confederate flag one way or the other, right? I mean, like, okay. they're not flying Confederate flag in Boston, <laughs> yeah, they're not yeah, flying yeah. in California. Okay. I mean, you know, my students from those places are like, what do I care about this? Right. It's only when I said I was coming to Tulane that people were like, do they fly the Confederate flag <laughs> down there? But the thing is, we get distracted by these things and we, do, we don't want to think about these structural, the things that we've inherited structurally, like, I mean, the only reason I'm talking to you today is because of my white privilege that was built on a culture of white supremacy. Like, I couldn't have gone to the schools I went to or gotten to the place I was without my white advantage. You know, there's this, I always tell my students this quote, this Chris Rock quote, which, which he's, where he says, a black man has to walk to what a white man can fly to, <laughs> okay? And that's, you know, but nobody wants to own that. And we see this in Oklahoma too. I mean, this is the unfortunate thing that happens with all these incidents, whether it's Ferguson or whether it's Oklahoma, is that we want to just blame, Ferguson's actually an even better example. It's because like, oh, well the fire chief quit, I mean the fire chief, the police chief quits, yeah. and now everything's okay? No, this stuff is like in our blood. There's a, I mean, one of the sort of real motivations for my work is there's a uh, historian, a religious histor historian who's at Duke University who writes about growing up in North Carolina as a kid in the late 60s and early 70s. And he has this quote where he says, white supremacy was the water and we were the fish. And you know, there's like no better way to understand it than that. Cause it's not that he was, he felt racist himself. Right. But that it was just everywhere. You couldn't escape it, it's the water. It's the oxygen that we're breathing, right? But the problem is when we get to right now, it's like nobody, including myself, wants to say, oh, well, I'll give up my advantages, right? Like, okay. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, okay. because everybody wants to think I earned where I am, you know, I worked hard in my way, yeah. but if, if we're going with Chris Rock's formulation, I started here, you know, and I don't want to think that I started here. I want to think, oh, we are all started right here and I worked this hard to get here. It's really hard for people, I think, particularly of like a, social, a certain socioeconomic bracket to say, well, these advantages that I enjoy are built on someone else, first of all, someone else's enslavement. I mean, that's really the most literal way that I like to think about it, yeah. but also just on keeping someone else down. That's an active pro you know, that's an active process that we have to continue to do that, or my privilege that allows me to be right here ends. By the way. Like yeah. The, oh, your students. Tell me about. I mean, how do, how how are they grabbing the information? <laughs> I mean, I think certain things are more. You know, when you show the, the these OU videos that have come out, it's hard for them to say, well, like this. I mean, because it's so close. I mean, I taught at the University of South Carolina before I came to Tulane, and it's even closer to that. You know, like this. I, I was like, these could be my students from University of South Carolina. Yeah. I mean, they just look. Yeah. 
Everything about it, it just looks the same. Um, so I love that. I mean, I was, I, I, I have trouble containing my joy. When that, those videos came out, I mean, it's depressing. Okay. <laughs> but I'm overjoyed because it's exposing. So I, what I said to them is, if this video hadn't come out, what's that mean? Does it mean that it doesn't exist? Of course not. It means that on all those frat buses <laughs> all over the country, things yes. like that are happening. We just don't know about them. Right, right. So, I mean, I think that there's that that tendency, and this is, you know, part of just the psychology of human beings, right. that we have to get through our day. We can't think about every problem in the world right. every, every minute of every day. Right. But there's something about things like that. I mean, I obviously think that if there's, if you can only tell one story about American history, it better be slavery. That's the story. So when people start saying, well, what about this? I'm like, no, there's one story. It's the enslavement of human beings for two centuries or more, and then whether we've done anything to actually address those wounds, whether they're psychological, social, economic, education, you know, they're all these things that ripple out from that. That's the story of, of American history. So what's been insane about being in the history profession in the last decade is just, you know, in the age of Obama, is that people who want to say, oh, we fired the police chief, things are better. Oh, we got a black president, things are better. Well, that's insane. <laughs> it's like, it's the material reality, the material advantage and disadvantage doesn't change just because we have a black president. Right. However good or bad you think he's a job he's done, it doesn't change the material reality. I mean, I heard someone on the radio, a black actress talking about, I can't remember what show she was on, and saying it was she was talking about her co-star and saying, like, she was older. Can you imagine what it's like? This woman's on a billboard. I was driving into Manhattan, she was saying, and I saw my co-star, a black woman on a billboard. Like, that wasn't possible when I was a kid. You know, that's just what that does psychologically. See a black person in the White House, see a black family in the White House. It's powerful, I'm not trying to deny okay. that, but that we're talking about systemic problems. We're talking about things that are, that are cancers, they aren't cuts, you know what I mean? You can't just put a Band-Aid on or you can't just get some hydrogen peroxide. This is stuff that may be even in our DNA, you know, like how do we get rid of it? There's this awesome documentary that I showed my students a couple weeks ago from PBS, which is about this uh, social researcher and uh, anthropologist guy named Gunnar Myrdal. Okay. And it's, it's, he was sort of studying race in the South in the late 30s and early 40s. The documentary kind of gets off of him to talk about these tests that they have, which are the subconscious bias tests. And they say, who are the most trustworthy people in society? Doctors. Oh, and I said to my students, well, I don't necessarily agree with that, but <laughs> let's go with that. Okay, yeah. doctors. And they have doctors take these subconscious bias tests. And it's, you know, white patient with heart disease, black patient with heart disease. And it's so disturbing. You know what I mean? That they're going to recommend these hugely expensive procedures for white patients over and over and over again and not to black patients. And they don't even know they're doing it. So what I, what I think is so fascinating about America today, for, you know, you go into 1860 America and everyone was racist, North and South, everybody's racist. That's what I tell people. Like, don't, don't think that Abe Lincoln was any less racist than Jefferson Davis, they all were racist, all right? But their racism was expressed in different ways, which is part of the reason why we think about the South and North in different ways. But now, I think you're hard pressed to find, it's not that you can't find them, but you're hard pressed to find people who are gonna openly say racist things. Everybody knows you, it's kind of unsafe to say that. But everyone thinks it. And even if they don't know, I mean these tests are just showing that even if we don't know, we could, right before we take the test, we can say, I don't believe the races are, there's any difference. But when we take this test, we're gonna associate black with all these bad things and white with all these good things. It's, it's awful. So how do you undo that? I mean, these are like huge, Huge social problems. But I mean, obviously, f in, from my perspective, it, unless you know what happened, or unless you know the origins of some of these things, how they actually came to be such a firm part of our consciousness, that's what I'm interested in, okay. then we can't get anywhere. I mean, we're just gonna be stuck in this sort of revolving door of thinking we're making progress and then just spinning around again to Ferguson and then spinning around again to some other horrible racial incident. You know, it's yeah. just gonna keep happening. Yeah. Yeah, 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 I don't have the answer, I mean. <laughs> Come on, tell me. <laughs> That's what I always say to my students. I don't know the answer, you have to tell me what to do. Good God. But, I mean, but that's the key, without understanding the context, 
Right. We're blind. Well, yeah. And I, there was a there was a book review in the uh, in the New York Times. It was it was reviewing these two um, books by black conservatives about the, you know the, this is really age old the, the harsh criticisms of social welfare. Okay. Um, and it's it's it shouldn't be a surprise to people, though it is always that the first social welfare organization in the United States was the Freedmen's Bureau. So like the first welfare was just trying to help out freed slaves. But these people, I mean, I, I can't remember their names, these guys who wrote these books, but they're basically saying, you know, social welfare failed us. And I mean, this is a huge swamp that I'm probably not gonna wade into, but I, the point that this reviewer was making is that, you know, these criticisms are in and of themselves completely ignoring some of the fundamental problems or dynamics that are in place. You know, blaming this, you know, whatever the, crappy solution that someone came up with, which yeah. most social welfare organizations, there's bad solutions to really big problems. Right, right. They're not addressing the big problem at all. Okay. You know, it's this, this thing where we say, oh, well, you should be able to pick yourself up from your bootstraps, because we did. And then we get back to this Chris Rock thing. If I'm starting here, my bootstraps don't, <laughs> they're not in the mud, or they're not in the, they're not in the swamp in the right. same way that yours are. Right. And that dynamic, I think, is something that people we just have an enormously hard time with even just on an individual level because we want to think what we earned, we earned, or where we are, we got here ourselves. Right, right. And it's not true. <laughs> you know, it's just not true. And I mean, this then this kind of gets into this whole, you know, reparations conversation or, you know, but... I, that's when I really try to press my students because we're t I'm teaching history, so I don't have to necessarily talk about today. I can okay. go like let's talk about the post-war. Okay. Shouldn't we just have just totally gone crazy in 1865, like confiscated all the land, right. you know, from plantation owners, like literally taken away that's white right. citizenship? They kept, the land. they kept everything. Good God! The money, the political influence. They didn't lose. They didn't lose anything. <laughs> They didn't lose anything. Yeah, they didn't lose. I mean, they lost a lot. I mean, I mean you know, <laughs> but they but, didn't lose anything. But I mean, after they, the war is yeah. over. Yeah. I mean, basically, what they came out of the, the way the it, the best way to tell it is they went into the war with a hundred thousand dollars and they came out with thirty. Poor them. You know. What I mean? You know what I mean? They lost their slaves, so their way of life changed. But they basically then just turned those slaves into sharecroppers, or you know, they kept their place in society almost entirely intact. You know. Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay, we just have five more minutes. We got to redo this again. Um, when we move forward, take us to today. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> there's a lot of history in between <laughs> then and now. Uh, I mean, it's a complicated process. And, uh, you know, the book that I'm working on right now is about this sort of episode in the 1960s when a white southerner writes a novel about a black slave rebel, a guy named Nat Turner. Um, but he writes that book in the first person, so he writes it in the voice of the black slave rebel. So already, you know, alarm bells are probably going off to people who are thinking, well, that's not necessarily a good idea, you know? Um, but the story he's telling, and so I'm really interested in these extreme examples. So my first book is about John Brown, who's a white guy who invaded the South to get rid of slavery. And the second book, the second sort of monograph research book is about this slave rebel, it's the, it's the most successful, most fully realized slave rebellion in American yeah, history. Right. Virtually nothing is known about this guy. I mean, you know, we know the sort of bare outlines of his plot. Um, but why did people want to read a novel about him written by a white guy in the 1960s? <laughs> I mean, it's just like all these things sort of colliding. Um, and I think that the world we live in today, and this is to actually to some extent what these uh, writers I was telling you a minute about, uh, a minute ago was, were talking about, these black conservatives, is that the 60s really shaped a huge amount of the last half century of how we perceive race and how race has sort of trickled down into our lives, which is that there was, you know, the greatest black leaders probably in the history of the United States. I mean, Frederick Douglass, Malcolm X, right. MLK, I mean, these right. guys are the big guns. Right. And that they all came along in this decade with radically different ideas. I mean, they were all radical ideas, but they were radically different from each other. Right. Um, and the fact that there was a sort of movement that was, uh, you know, putting black violence as a positive. Right. And Malcolm X kind of faded out of that, but when the Panthers came along, 
Right. And this is the context in which this book about a slave rebel comes along. And you're just like, I mean, America's rioting. It's Newark and Watts and this stuff is exploding. Race is exploding in the 60s. Okay. And not in a way that there's a clear direction. You know, I think right. what we remember about it is I have a dream. But really, it's like there's nightmare along with the dream. And King is shot and Malcolm right. is shot. And, right. you know, what, what does all that mean to Americans for the next the succeeding decades, right. it's a pretty grim picture, you know, where what we inherit from that, I think, is a sense of futility, yeah. you know, where activism, I mean, the the leaders that we inherited from that era, they ain't no, ain't no, no King and no, Malcolm, you no, know what no, I mean? No, 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 <laughs> they're, no, not, no. they're not of that same caliber, no, not just no. in terms of moral leadership, but no. eloquence and, yeah. you know, uh, intelligence, you know, yeah. genius, yeah. a yeah. genius in yeah. terms of uh, organizing. Yeah. Yeah, we yeah. are left with these sort of yeah. scraps to try to find our way in a world that's increasingly ignoring that there is white supremacy. Uh, because the, you say King came along and we got the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, and we're okay. There's, a, right. I think that that's the thing my students have really gotten on this semester, which is great. That America loves to pat itself on the back that we've moved past right. these these skeletons in our right. closet. Right, right, right. And what if the skeleton in the closet just like? It's in us. <laughs> it's not in the closet. It's morphing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting bigger. It's getting yeah. stronger. It's yeah. it, it, be, because it's more hidden and it's getting stronger. And, and I think that that's so. I brought that up. You know, this this actress seeing the billboard with the, with with her colleague on it and saying, you know, we've come we've come far. That no one should deny that we haven't yeah. come from, right. far from slavery. But the thing is, when we tell ourselves we've come so far. We get further back, I think. You know that that's something when we tell ourselves, "Oh, look how far we've come," right. we ignore that there's still a long way to go, and that we're sort of when we say that we're ignoring all the circumstances that have put us in these terrible situations. What is true reality? Oh, my lord! Uh, this is uh, Doctor Gilpin. Um, uh, we appreciate you. Uh, we're closing now, but uh, study learn, seek truth, never move from truth and with all you can, with everything you have, because humanity needs it, society needs it, and we need it. Stay strong, great sir.